Chapter 13, Concepts of Fluid and Electrolyte Balance and Imbalance. This chapter begins for you in your Iggy Text 11th edition on page 246. The concepts of this chapter we will review are fluid and electrolyte balance in relation to fluid overload and dehydration. Some of the fluid and electrolyte Concepts will be a review from your fundamentals lecture last semester. We will begin with a anatomy and physiology review. It is helpful within your share path that you also review the osmosis videos for module one as it will add a visual aid as we review these terms. It's important that you can distinguish extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid components as well as a solvent versus a solute and then osmosis um, compared to diffusion. Our body is more than 50% water. The purpose of these body fluids is to deliver dissolved nutrients and electrolytes to all of our organs, tissues, and cells. This is critical to regulation and management of body temperature, blood pressure, our ability to excrete toxins, lubricate joints, and hydrate our skin. Therefore, again, it's critical to life and health. There is a certain percentage of this body fluid that is stored in very specific areas of our body within the intracellular and extracellular spaces. Our extracellular fluid component is outside of our cell, um, consisting of interstitial fluid and plasma volumes. This is one third of our total body fluid. Within the extracellular fluid components, again, there's this intravascular space this is referring to plasma volume. And then your interstitial spaces is the fluid between the cells. I'll have a handout in class um, that I'll provide for you that will elaborate on this more. Um, when fluid removes and in, moves into the interstitial spaces outside of the circulatory system, this is called third spacing. This is typically occurring due to an injury, so not something that we like um, to see in our patients. When the fluid moves into these spaces uh, between the tissues and organs, um, when it occurs in our lungs, um, it's occurring movement into the alveoli. This is called pulmonary edema. And then when it moves into the deeper layers of the skin or mucosa, um, we refer to this as angioedema. Unfortunately, this trapped fluid resistance represents a volume loss as it's not able to provide that movement of fluid, electrolytes, um, nutrition, and oxygen that we need for normal homeostasis. Now your intracellular fluid component, this as the term implies is inside your cells. This makes up two thirds of our body fluid. So this is the majority. Um, fluid in each of these body components contain electrolytes and we'll expand into um, normal um, electrolyte values and where they should be stored and then we'll move into um, electrolyte values as far as hypo or hyper and how we will assess our patient, um, prioritize care for our patient and expected interventions for our patient and then how we will determine if those interventions were effective or ineffective. Again to function normally body cells must have fluid and electrolytes in the right components and in the right amount. Now we will dig a little bit deeper into terms of diffusion and osmosis as it relates um, to the movement of fluid or particles. Again, very important that you can differentiate between these terms. We will begin with diffusion. This is the spreading of molecules from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. So again, a movement of molecules, not a movement of fluid. Um, diffusion occurs with fluid compartments such as a barrier. So think of a cellular membrane. If that cellular membrane is permeable to that particular molecule 
or solute, then it can diffuse substances. Um, but what we'll talk about is most more commonly, our cellular membranes have a semi-permeable bar barrier that's going to prevent um, certain particles and electrolytes from making that movement without the use of energy or ATP. So therefore, more commonly, we see the example um, of osmosis used for movement of fluid across the semipermeable membrane to maintain homeostasis. Filtration is the movement of solutes and solvents by hydrostatic pressure from an area of higher pressure to one of lower. Osmosis is the movement of solvent molecules, so you want to think fluid here, um, across a membrane in response to a concentration gradient, usually from a solution um, of lower to one of higher solute concentration. So the goal of this fluid is to move from an area that has a lower volume of solutes to that higher volume of solutes to aid in um, dilution or that constant gradient to be even. The osmotic pressure is the force or pull that draws that solvent from an area of less concentrated solute through a selective permital membrane into a more concentrated solute to equalize the concentration of the solvent. So osmotic pressure is also trying to draw or pull that solvent from an area of less concentration, okay, through that membrane, that selectable permeal membrane, so it's still a movement of fluid into a more concentrated solute, so more concentrated molecules or particles or electrolytes to equalize concentration. The goal here is to provide equalization. When one or more of these concentrated solutions is on one side of a selected permeal membrane, and then you have the less concentrated solution on the other side, there will always be this presence of pull of osmotic pressure um, through that semi-permeal membrane on fluid to the more concentrated side. Um, we'll, I'll give you an example here upcoming. We're going to talk about the osmotic pull in relation to the capillary bed. This is the how you how you have offloading of oxygen, nutrition um, to from your arter arteries to your um, veins and then vice versa, how that pressure gradient will change as we're trying to rid cellular waste um, back into circulation so that it can be excreted. Now, hydrostatic pressure is the force exerted by the weight of a solution. So when a difference exists in a hydrostatic pressure on two sides of a membrane, you'll have water and diffusible solutes that will move out of the solution that has the higher hydrostatic pressure, and this is going to occur via filtration, okay? So you want to, in your mind, synchronize the hydrostatic pressure component with filtration, and then osmosis component with osmotic pressure, okay? Again, with that being osmotic pressure is pull or draw, allowing for osmosis in a particular direction to achieve equilibrium, or you have hydrostatic pressure that's going to attempt to achieve equilibrium through filtration. Okay, so at the arterial end of a capillary, that hydrostatic pressure is going to be um, higher than the osmotic pressure so that your fluids, oxygen, solutes can move out of the capillaries. And then at the venous end of that capillary bed, your osmotic pressure or pull is higher than your hydrostatic pressure. So you're going to have movement into the capillary so that we can have removal of waste. Osmolarity is another term that you need to um, commit um, to knowing throughout your nursing career. It's going to be extremely helpful for you as we talk about the incorporation of fluid replacement with hypertonic, hypotonic, isotonic fluids. If you're aware of the osmolarity, 
um, of plasma and then also aware of the osmolarity of what your patient is receiving, you will be able to determine if this is appropriate and safe for your patient. So osmolarity is the concentration of a solution. Normal osmolarity of plasma is 275 to 295 millimoles um, unit of measurement, okay, for osmotic pressure. Again, knowing this range, the 275 to 295 milliosmoles is going to allow you to look in an IV um, fluid solution to determine if it's isotonic, hypotonic, or hypertonic. Keep remembering that these cellular membranes and capillary walls separate your body components, okay? They separate you, the components into that intravascu intravascular or intracellular and extracellular spaces. So fluid and electrolytes must be kept in this balance. Um, when they're out of balance, we typically have um, cellular hypoxia and then cellular death can occur with that being prolonged due to the ischemia present. I will also provide you in class with an isotonic solutions table, um, and I will discuss this further in chapter 15. So solutions on both sides of the membrane have that established equilibrium that's gonna allow for homeostasis, okay? And that's where our body likes to live. Any shift in this equilibrium, our body's gonna attempt to compensate, um, and then there's gonna be specific care and signs and symptoms we'll see in our patient when there's disequilibrium of fluid and electrolytes. So your isotonic solutions, meaning they're isotonic to human cells, there will be no osmosis that's going to occur with administration of isotonic solutions, okay? They are equal in osmolarity to your plasma. So again, that's 275 to 295 milliosmoles, okay? Your isotonic fluids, one we're most common with is 0.9% um, normal saline or just term normal saline with that same concentration of plasma osmolarity. Your hypotonic solutions, hypo, has a lower concentration of your salt or solutes than an isotonic solution and has a lower osmolarity than body fluids. So if we remember that our normal osmolarity of plasma is 275 to 295 milliosmoles, then we know that our hypotonic solution is gonna have less than the 275 milliosmoles of osmotic pressure. Therefore, we will have osmosis that occurs here. Remember, osmosis is movement of fluid, your, sol your solvent and it's not movement of solutes or particles. So osmosis with your hypotonic solutions will cause um, your cells to try to achieve homeostasis by drawing fluid into your cells. So that's how your cells begin to swell in response to the administration of hypotonic fluids. Later in lecture, we will talk about um, when this may be indicated, and then um, appropriate responses we should see in our patient, but also adverse responses that we always have to monitor for, and why these um, administration of these fluids are done so very carefully. Now, your hypertonic solutions, hyper, we now have more solutes or higher osmolarity than body fluids. So if we're remembering that our normal osmolarity of our plasma is 275 to 295. A hypertonic fluid usually has an osmolarity um, greater than 300. Okay. Osmosis will occur here. Again, the only place we're not gonna have osmosis occur is if we're administering an isotonic solution to our patient. So osmosis is gonna occur. This means that we're gonna have a fluid shift, okay? into our vascular spaces to achieve that homeostatic um, environment that our cells need to thrive and do the job that they're specialized to do. So when this happens, you will see sh cells shrink. So they will shrink and shrivel as they um, lose their intracellular fluid across that permal membrane into the vascular space 
in response to administration of this hypertonic solution, as that fluid crosses the semipermeable membrane via osmosis, its goal is to dilute that hypertonic solution so we can achieve equilibrium across the membrane. I need you to look at the fluid and electrolyte assessment as part of the laboratory profile. It's a purple box on page 251 of your text, table 13.1. Very important that you know the normal ranges of your electrolytes listed here and the significance of these abnormal values. I know that from facility to facility, you can see that maybe in our book we have Sodium is 135, sorry, 136 to 145. You may see in your hospital facility it's 135 to 145. So it may vary a little bit, but not significantly so that's going to um, affect um, you in preparation for your exam um, or NCLEX. So when talking about fluid and electrolyte balance, so balance meaning that homeostasis has been achieved, fluid and electrolytes are in the are in the components of the cells or vascular spaces that they should be. So you have blood electrolytes. These are minerals that either have a positive or negative charge. This should be a review from your A&P. Your body fluids are neutral. So depending on the number of electrolytes and their placement, this is going to allow for a positive or negative charge that will maintain electrolyte balance. On the opposite, you have electrolyte imbalances. These can occur in healthy people. We'll talk about risk for this due to changes in intake and output. Um, most commonly, our goal here is that we can recognize this early in our patient. Um, we can easily correct these imbalances to maintain homeostasis and then provide some education um, and health maintenance strategies for our patient. Your older adult population is going to be at high risk for fluid and electrolyte balances as highlighted in the older adult consideration box on page 251 of your text. Older adults are more likely to be taking um, medications that impact their fluid and electrolyte balance. We can think about many of these, including um, diuretic therapy, but our older adults also have less total body um, water than our younger adult population. So that also predisposes um, our older adults. Most electrolytes are going to enter our body through ingested food and then that balance being maintained with dietary intake, regulating with our kidney um, excretion of electrolytes. So any changes in our ingestion of our food, so NPO status, um, NG suctioning, and then kidney compromise, acute kidney injury, chronic kidney disease. Again, you can see how this would easily shift your ability to maintain balance of electrolytes. Now we're going to talk about the regulation of fluid balance via the assistance of hormones. Hormones we're going to focus on here are aldosterone, our antidiuretic hormone, also termed ADH, and our natremic peptide, or NP. So let's talk about blood pressure. If you have a low blood pressure, your kidneys are usually going to say, I can help with that, okay? And they're going to release a hormone called aldosterone to help increase blood pressure. The way this is going to happen is you, on top of your kidneys, you have your adrenal glands. Again, should be a review from A&P. Inside your adrenal glands are your adrenal cortex and your adrenal medulla. Your adrenal cortex will release this aldosterone, whereas your adrenal medulla will, will release catecholamines. Okay? Your posterior pituitary is your ability. It's going to allow communication um, with your adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. It's going to receive this communication, your posterior pituitary, from your hypothalamus. So from hypothalamus to posterior pituitary, then you have signaling to your um, adrenal cortex to release this aldosterone. So you can see just in this short explanation that if there is any injury or impairment of any of these glands as a part of your endocrine system, it's going to affect um, the ability to regulate your blood pressure. Um, we'll talk about this more throughout 1940. Um, as part of the RAS system, but we'll also devy a lot into it in 2930 in that endocrine module.
As your textbook states, your aldosterone regulates water um, and sodium loss, and that's where we have this regulation of blood pressure. So I tend to remember that um, water, follows, water follows sodium, okay? So when we're talking about one, we're talking about the other. So in order for us to have sufficient blood pressure, we have to have aldosterone regulation. When it's secreted, and again, it's going to be um, secreted by your adrenal gland and within that adrenal cortex within that gland. It's going to trigger reabsorption and, of sodium and water from your urine. Okay, so it's going to allow for more concentrated urine. It's going to, as it reaches those distal tubules, it's going to say, no, I, I need that water. I got to, I got to help with this low blood pressure situation. So it's gonna allow that volume of fluid back into the blood. And there is also an inverse relationship between electrolytes. I'll talk about this more in class with a handout and also we'll likely draw it on the board for you. Um, this is when one electrolyte goes up and, one, and another one goes down. So inverse relationship. One we're gonna talk about in relation to aldosterone is sodium and potassium, okay? The control of this exchange is gonna be governed um, by aldosterone and angiotensin two, okay? So that's gonna help with this inverse um, relationship and the regulation of potassium and sodium. So let's recall from AMP that your aldosterone, when it's secreted, okay, it's gonna increase the release of potassium via your urine, and then it's going to allow for reabsorption of sodium, water follows sodium, and that distal tubular of the kidney that's gonna help stabilize our blood pressure, okay? So aldosterone is released. Um, also, if blood levels of potassium are increased, or if blood levels of sodium are severely decreased. So in addition to blood pressure being decreased, that would be a reason for aldosterone to be released. If you had hyperkalemia, so increased potassium would be another reason to have aldosterone released. Or if um, we're experiencing hyponatremia or severely low sodium. The regulation of the release of your aldosterone is in a negative feedback loop. Okay, so increased osmolarity of the extracellular fluid is gonna inhibit the release of aldosterone, okay? Now let's talk about your antidiuretic hormone, that ADH hormone. So what do we know about diuretic therapy? So diuretic therapy, yes, we know this helps us get rid of fluid via voiding. So anti-diuretic anti hormone is a hormone release from, again, the posterior pituitary gland that's gonna allow you to hold on to fluid. Okay, so anti meaning we're going to hold on to fluid. So if we have an increase in plasma sodium, this is going to result in shrinkage of cells of the osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus, and then that's going to trigger your ADH release. ADH is going to act on your kidney nephrons, resulting in reabsorption of fluid by those distal tubules and return of that fluid to the blood um, to allow us to dilute those solvents. Now, the natriuretic peptide, these are hormones that are located in special cells that line your atrium and ventricles of your heart. So as the atrium and ventricles of your heart um, experience increased pressure, okay, increased blood volume, so think fluid overload and increased pressure from too much volume, it's going to stretch that um, lining, the tissue lining of your atrium and ventricles where these cells are located that had the natriuretic peptide hormones. As they are stretched, um, as they respond to this increased volume, your natriuretic peptide binds to the neuroceptors. It's gonna be released from those special cells in the lining of the atrial ventricles in response to excessive pressure and volume. It's then going to bind to receptors in the nephrons. It's going to inhibit, so not um, allowing for reabsorption in sodium. And, um, and this is gonna allow for urine output to increase, which decreases blood volume. So up until this point, we've talked about the antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone that's helping in low pressure situations, low volume situations. So we're now talking about 
the natremic peptide hormone in response to volume overload or too much volume. You'll see in your text on page 244, figure 13.9, how the natremic peptide talks with the RAS system um, to in turn decrease aldosterone so that we can again allow for um, no additional fluid retention and allow for elimination of that um, excessive fluid via um, urination. So very important that you visit um, that figure 13.7 to see it kind of wrap up the whole picture for you. On this slide, we're going to dig into the renin angiotensin aldosterone system or RAS system further. Again, as I reference this and talk you through it, I think it's helpful um, that you reference figure 13.6 on 253 of your text. The renin, renin angiotensin aldosterone system, it's a mechanism to regulate blood pressure. Okay, so we've already talked about aldosterone, but we're now going to begin to incorporate these renin and angiotensin components. The goal of this is to allow for proper tissue and organ perfusion with adequate maintenance of blood pressure via our kidneys through that action of sodium and water. So again, when our kidneys pick up, hey, we have decreased perfusion. Usually this starts with systolic blood pressure. It's less than 90. Um, it's going to activate this RAS pathway. You're going to have renin, okay, that's going to be um, secreted as an enzyme from the kidneys. Once renin is in the bloodstream, it's going to move to your liver to release a protein called angiotensogenin and undergo a reaction with renin to produce angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 travels to the lungs. Think of angio. Um, Tensogen as your little brother or little sister, it's not able to do much vasoconstriction, okay, to help with maintenance of blood pressure. But when it moves to the lungs, it's going to combine with angiotensin converting enzyme or your ACE, okay. Um, when it combines with this, it's going to be converted to angiotensin 2. This is your potent vaso. Um, constrictor here. So it's going to then travel to your adrenal cortex. Remember, adrenal cortex is in the adrenal gland on top of our kidneys. Um, this is where your angiotensin 2 is going to stimulate the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. Okay, so again, painting the bigger picture here for you, which is going to lead to the re um, retaining of sodium. Hence, we're going to then be begin to retain water and we're going to have increased in our blood pressure and hopefully return to homeostasis with adequate perfusion of our tissues and organs. That angiotensin 2 is going to cause that constriction, increase um, the kidneys um, perfusion, and then we're going to see decreased urine output during this time as we're trying to um, increase the uptake of that fluid from the distal tubules via reabsorption of sodium and water. So let's try to apply this clinically. Let's say you have a client, um, you're caring for a patient, you may get a call, you're working the ED, there's a client en route who's had a major hip fracture fall. When um, this is, when we talk about a hip fracture or large bones of our body, when these experience fracture, there is drastic major loss, major hemorrhaging of blood. So this would be acute blood loss our, our patient is experiencing. Our body, when we have this acute blood loss, we will have a drop in blood pressure. So our body as a protective mechanism is going to activate the RAS system, okay? And so what we expect to see in our patient would be um, typically decreased urine output, okay? So urine output decreased is not an abnormal finding for our patient who's experiencing acute blood loss. It's compensation of our body trying to hold on um, to sodium and fluid. I've seen this in post-op patients with students caring for those who've returned to the floor who either still have a Foley in or it was recently DC'd and um, they're not voiding appropriately. And typically if this patient does not have a Foley, that usually leads to assessment with a bladder scanner. And then there's question of 
oh my goodness, they no reason they're not voiding. They don't, they're not holding any significant volume of urine in their bladder. And if you start looking at their most recent H and H postoperatively, or you read the surgery report to get an idea of how much blood was lost during surgery, you can start to make that kind of clinical judgment correlation of why, why this is happening and how we can um, assist our patient with maintaining homeostasis and interventions, whether that's gonna typically with that will be an isotonic um, fluid selection to try to assist them. We want to monitor urine output closely and any of our patients experiencing um, acute blood loss, because again, this is gonna indicate for us, is there adequate perfusion? Or is there not, and we're still not having adequate urine output? Doesn't mean we aren't excreting enough to eliminate toxins, but not enough to indicate hydration um, and homeostasis. Beginning here in your text, we're gonna talk about the normal levels of electrolytes of sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium before we move into um, dehydration, fluid overload, and electrolyte imbalances. We're gonna begin with talking about sodium. It's a major positively charged ion in the extracellular fluid. Um, sodium levels of extracellular fluid are high and intracellular fluid is low. So we like it higher, higher concentration of sodium in the extracellular fluid versus the intracellular fluid in order to maintain the proper electrical charge or gradient and homeostasis for cellular function. Your sodium is vital for muscle contractions, cardiac contractions, nerve impulses. Your sodium levels again are gonna be influenced by body volume. Just keep remembering that wherever that sodium goes, water goes. So your extracellular fluid is going to determine if fluid is um, retained, um, excreted, or moved from one space to another. So let's talk about where high levels of sodium are usually found. This is in processed and um, foods with preservatives. Our lowest concentrations tend to be in chicken, fish, fresh fruits, and vegetables. So this makes sense, right? As we talk with our patients who may be on cardiac fit, um, or heart healthy diets that they follow what we call the Mediterranean styles diets, which usually has those higher concentrations of foods that have lower um, volumes of sodium because we do not want them to be retaining that excessive fluid. You're going to have regulation of sodium by your kidneys. This should be a review of our previous slide. This is under the influence of those hormones. Um, aldosterone, antidiuretic, ADH hormone, or natriuretic peptide. Your low levels will inhibit the secretion of your antidiuretic hormone and the natriuretic peptide, and it's going to trigger RAS, okay, so that then we would have increased reabsorption of sodium um, and excretion of fluid. High levels will usually, for your sodium, it's going to inhibit your aldosterone secretion um, and stimulate your antidiuretic hormone and your natriuretic peptide release to increase sodium excretion um, and water reabsorption. Potassium. Whenever we talk about potassium, I want you to always think cardiac, 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 cardiac. Potassium is a major cation of the intracellular fluid, so opposite that of sodium. Your body does not like high or low levels um, of potassium. As you see, this is an error range. It's 3.5 to 5, but any hinkling lower on the higher end of that, our body can be very sensitive and can be extremely influential to our cardiac function. So we talked earlier about that inverse relationship between sodium and potassium. Let's talk about another um, dependent relationship and that's with potassium and magnesium. So your magnesium is your major transporter for potassium across your cellular membrane so that it can reach that intracellular fluid. So it's important that if we have a patient who's experiencing an imbalance of Potassium, that there's also assessment of their magnesium because they typically go hand in hand, follow each other um, in the same direction. Now, 80% of your potassium is removed by your kidneys. 
So you can imagine those with um, impaired renal function, they um, are at higher risk for experiencing hyperkalemia. And we'll talk about that more upcoming in this lecture. Your higher levels of potassium are gonna be in meat, fish, many um, fruits and vegetables also contain a high level of potassium. Calcium is the workhorse, okay? It's gonna activate enzymes, a big important factor in the contraction, the power of that contraction for our cardiac and skeletal muscle. It's gonna aid in controlling nerve impulses, um, transmission, and then enhance blood clotting. Also with calcium, it's gonna rely on magnesium to be a transporter across your cellular membrane. So same thing as we just talked about with potassium. If mag is low, calcium is, is likely low as well. Absorption of your dietary calcium requires vitamin D. Okay, that's how we're able to absorb the calcium that we intake in our foods. Typically, calcium is going to be in store, uh, stored in our bone matrix. It can be released if we're experiencing low calcium levels. Um, this is going to happen via the parathyroid hormone being released. Now, when we have excessive calcium present, you actually have the TCH hormone or the thyrocalcitonin that's secreted by your thyroid gland, leading to decreased bone reabsorption of calcium. Also gonna inhibit intestinal uptake of calcium and increase your ability of your kidneys to release calcium in your urine. So hormones, again, um, those adrenal glands and hormones are playing a part, significant part in ability to maintain homeostasis of your electrolytes. Magnesium, now it's mostly stored in bones and cartilage as well. It also assists with skeletal muscle contraction, metabolism, generation of our energy stores, um, blood coagulation and cellular growth. Most of our uh, magnesium is um, stored in the bone and cartilage. There's not a large presence in our blood. Like your potassium, calcium, and magnesium, it is more concentrated in that intracellular fluid when it's present. Now we're gonna to begin to talk about dehydration beginning on page 255 of your text. So first let's talk about what's, what's happening in the body. What's the pathophysiology here? With dehydration, there's a deficiency in fluid volume, usually due to actual decrease in total body water caused by little intake or too great a loss of that fluid. When circulating blood volume is decreased, termed hypovolemia, we then may experience inadequate or decreased perfusion to tissues and organs. We've talked about this. There's a defense mechanism in place to maintain perfusion of vital organs via vasoconstriction with the RAS system. So health promotion and maintenance in the setting of dehydration is on 256 of your text. We'll focus here mainly on teaching for management or prevention strategies. We want to encourage our clients to match their fluid intake with fluid output, adequate fluid intake um, when engaging in heavy or prolonged physical activity. Beverages with caffeine and alcohol are going to increase voiding, increase our fluid loss. So we want to discourage the use um, of these beverages um, when teaching our client about how to manage their adequate fluid volume at home. Recognizing cues as a part of the assessment process of nursing. I cannot focus so much on your assessment abilities of your patient at all times. This is not something we do once and then move on. We're constantly assessing, reassessing, following up on interventions or changes in our patient status. Your healthcare team is dependent on your ability um, to be acute to changes in your patient. I like to remind students, as I was often thought about at the bedside, that my healthcare team or that provider rounds on my patient, they see like a trailer or that movie clip of patient presentation, whereas myself or the nurse at the bedside is seeing the movie, okay? You're spending the longest time with your patient. So our healthcare team and our patient 
is um, very dependent on your ability to recognize cues or changes um, in their status. So when talking about dehydration, what are the risk factors? Box 13.1 on page 255 of your text does list some of the common causes of dehydration. We've talked about our geriatrics, our older adult um, being at higher risk for dehydration due to less total body volume as well as additional factors such as the use of diuretics, um, diminished thirst sensation. You want to, again, refer to your older adults consideration box there. Now, what are we going to see in our assessment? So what are we going to see when we're assessing and reassessing our patient? As a part of their history, we want to ask about these medications and over-the-counter things. So when we're having that intake of our patient, um, we want to ask them what they've been taking at home. Has there been any changes in their prescription medications? Um, what do they take over-the-counter, even if it's vitamins? Um, what are they using? Is anything, is anything different? Do they have history of kidney or um, endocrine disorders? Why is this important? We just talked about the kidneys play the main factor in our ability of fluid and electrolyte elimination. And then our endocrine, our endocrine system, our endocrine glands, that hormone component is very important to fluid and electrolyte balance. Most common changes we're going to see in our um, patients is going to be a mental status change, usually an altered level of consciousness or cognition is going to be the first sign in your older adult. Typically, your patient's going to have an increased heart rate. Why are they going to have an increased heart rate? Because that's a component of blood pressure. So if we've lost our, if lost our volume, if we're losing our volume, we're going to increase our heart rate to see if we can continue um, to at least circulate the volume we do have. Okay, so that's why that heart rate um, ticks up. And then you're, you're going to have weak peripheral pulses. They're going to be thready, um, weak, um, hard um, to find. You're going to find your patient with decreased blood pressure. They also may experience orthostatic hypotension. This is that orthostatic change. This is occurring when your patient um, is changing positions from um, lying to sitting or sitting to standing. Well, what does that put our patient at risk for? This compromises their safety. It's going to significantly increase their risk of falls because as they make this position change, they're going to have a drop in blood pressure which is going to decrease perfusion of oxygen to their brain, and therefore they're going to feel lightheaded, dizzy, faint, okay? Um, so you want to make sure your patient with dehydration um, that you prioritize safety, prioritize fall prevention strategies, okay? Your patient may have increased respiratory rate. Again, this is due to decreased perfusion and gas exchange. Their skin may change. Um, with this, you may see they have, with your older adults, and um, they usually have tinting um, remaining for several minutes. Um, look at your adult consideration box there to see how we properly assess for skin turgor in our older adults across that sternum. And then neck veins. So our, our neck um, veins are usually distended in the supine position with adequate hydration. OK, so what we'd see in our dehydrated patient, if they're in that supine position, due to the lack of volume, those neck veins are going to be flat. OK, so you're not going to see distension in the supine position. You want to always inspect mucosal membranes because, again, that, that skin assessment may not be the most accurate for dryness or cracking um, with your urine. Due to the activation of the RAS system, we're going to expect decreased urine output. The urine, the urine is also going to be more concentrated, usually with a specific gravity greater than 1.030. It's going to be dark, amber in color, typically has a strong odor. Moving on now to your diagnostic assessment of your client with dehydration, what we can expect um, to be ordered with your patient um, CBC, BMP, urinalysis. Well, why are, why are these labs ordered? So a CBC, that's to assess for H and H. You know, is there um, a decrease? Is there acute volume loss that's causing this dehydration? Um, sometimes your H and H can be acutely elevated um, inappropriately. And this is because we've lost our plasma volume. Okay, and dehydration related to fluid loss. 
And when this happens, those um, blood cells become more concentrated. So when you have a venous puncture and a blood draw, you have more cells that are, that are in that sample. And it's not because there is an excess presence of them, but you don't have that plasma volume on board to give you an accurate assessment. So you would see as your patient um, achieved um, adequate hydration, homeostasis, that then they would, that elevated H and H would now come back into the normal range. Typically, their BUN is elevated. This always um, typically indicates outside of acute kidney injury situation is going to indicate dehydration. Um, we'll talk about electrolyte um, imbalances related to the dehydration status because, again, most of our electrolytes are going to come from nutritional intake and then glucose and protein as well. Your urinalysis was going to be assessed. You'll likely again see that concentrated urine um, presence there, and then your shift in electrolytes on your BMP. Now we're going to talk about nursing interventions and treatments you will anticipate. Um, when you're caring for your patient with dehydration, this is where we're generating solutions. We're acting on them to care for our patient. It's very important, our patient in dehydration um, or that one with fluid overload that we're obtaining serial weights. This is the best indicator for both fluid volume deficit, but also fluid gain. So thinking about our patient with dehydration as we um, act with interventions, that we continue to assess their weight to indicate that we're achieving our outcome of adequate hydration, but also being careful not to exceed our goal, goal um, and cause fluid overload. So one liter of water weighs 2.2 pounds. Important for you to remember this. Um, changes in daily weight, again, are that best indicator of loss or gain. So something we really want to teach our patient to as um, they maintain homeostasis and plan for discharge and, and home. Restoring fluid balance via fluid replacement and drug therapy. So your box on page 257, the patient with dehydration, your type of um, IV fluid is going to depend on that patient's cardiac status, their blood osmolarity. Um, they may have replacement of electrolytes and glucose incorporated into their um, fluids as well. Again, monitoring their heart rate and urine output response. Um, if they're experiencing tachycardia, as we expect with their dehydration, we expect that their heart rate will return to that normal range, 60 to 100 beats per minute. Urine output um, will increase, um, and then we'll see um, decrease in that concentration as well. Incorporation of drug therapy really revolves around the cause. So if they were um, losing this due to excessive diarrhea, they may have an antidiarrheal incorporated into their care. There may be antibiotics incorporated. Um, if there's um, an infection there, a bacterial infection contributing, antiemetics if it's excessive or prolonged vomiting, and antipyretics for fever management because we know that's insensible fluid um, loss through our skin. Now, prevention of in injury, I cannot stress this enough, again, for your patient with dehydration. The risk for falls due to orthostatic hypotension, um, risk of um, dysrhythmia due to electrolyte shifts, muscle weakness. They may be confused. Remember, that's that first indication usually in our older adult. So fall precautions. You want um, slow position changes. It's something you'd probably want to discuss with your assistive personnel as well and how they can keep their patients safe because you cannot be there. Um, at the bedside at all times. So your sister personnel, family members, your patient, um, advise them, you know, have that client dangle their lower extremities um, beside the bed before they ambulate, okay, to help to decrease that orthostatic shift and those, that symptom presentation. Evaluating outcomes. Another very crucial part of our clinical judgment model. Um, always evaluating our patient in response to our interventions. Um, how will we know that they're improving or not improving if we're not evaluating outcomes? So in relation to dehydration, we want to make sure they maintain an intake of 1,500 milliliters. This is um, a recommendation for your healthy adult, typically those without cardiac or renal 
disorders, you want to make sure they can maintain a normal blood pressure. So if they're having less orthostatic changes with positions, either through your BP assessment of lying, sitting, and standing blood pressures, but also their symptom report, that's a positive. That means we're, we're meeting an outcome there. They have moist mucous membranes. They have normal skin turgor. They haven't had any falls. They've been safe. Um, and they can state to us um, indications or their risk for dehydration, and they know how to start adequate fluid replacement at those first signs and symptoms of dehydration. And again, remember for our older adult, that's going to be um, the mental status changes or changes in level of consciousness. So let's talk about fluid overload, a quick pathophysiology overview. You have excessive body fluid. Um, this can be from fluid intake or retention that's greater than what the body needs, usually termed hypervolemia versus the hypovolemia we experience with dehydration. Um, severe overload can lead to heart failure, pulmonary edema. When we talked about pulmonary edema being this um, interstitial change where we have this fluid leak um, in our lungs and it's not able to assist us with homeostasis, perfusion, or diffusion of um, nutrition, electrolytes, or oxygen. Um, dilution of sodium potassium, we'll talk about this um, further in our chapter, can increase our risk of um, seizures, coma, and death. Okay, now we're going to go to the other side of the spectrum and talk about fluid overload. Um, risk factors for your patient are listed there in your text include excessive fluid replacement, kidney failure, heart failure, long use of corticosteroids. Hmm. Now, how would that work? So corticosteroids, we want to think about their relationship to our mineral corticosteroids, one of those being aldosterone. So what did we say aldosterone does? Aldosterone increases um, reabsorption of sodium in fluid with excretion of potassium. OK, um, activation of that RAS system. So if we have long use of corticosteroids, this is going to act like aldosterone. OK, um, so it's going to allow for excessive retention of fluid and sodium. And then also water intoxication is also another risk factor. So recognizing cues, what are we going to see in our patient who's experiencing fluid overload? Your key fe features are listed there in your text. Um, one of those I want to point out is the decreased pulse pressure. So what, what is pulse pressure? Pulse pressure is the difference between systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So for an example, with, let's say um, your blood pressure is 120 over 80. What's the difference in those two values? And the difference in those two values is 40. So your normal pulse pressure is usually between 40 to 60. With fluid overload, you have your ventricles that are going to have excessive amount of volume to push out. So higher pressures during the work phase of the heart, that's that systolic blood pressure. So your systolic blood pressure will be elevated with fluid overload. But diastolic blood pressure will also be increased because there's still fluid left over during the resting phase of our heart because it's still so obsessive and our heart's not able to pump it out during the work phase. So you'll develop this narrow or low pulse pressure, meaning that it is less than um, 40. OK, so you will see it termed in your exams and in class and in the text as a narrow or low, low pulse pressure. Now, what labs will you see on your patient? You're typically going to see decreased H&H, &H, um, and that is not because your patient's acutely experiencing blood loss. It's because of excessive fluid. So just as we talked about um, opposite with dehydration here, you have venous puncture into a vein and you're having removal um, of that plasma volume and there's excessive amounts of plasma volume. So there's not as many RBCs in that sample. So then you have this dilution of your RBCs. So a decrease H and H. Again, you'll typically see that's something to monitor for in your evaluating outcomes, that that's becoming um, back to a normal range for your patient. Now I will discuss the action nursing interventions that we'll see um, taken to take care of our patient who's experiencing fluid overload. Priorities are always ABCs. Um, airway, breathing, circulation, and safety. 
So looking at that critical rescue box on page 260 of your text, we have to monitor our patient closely for pulmonary edema, monitoring them at least every two hours. Um, this worsening overload can occur rapidly. Um, if you note that this is occurring, you want to activate um, a rapid response. Do not leave your patient. Um, safety also related to heart failure exacerbation or new um, due to the circulatory fluid overload, the skin breakdown. So we're talking about a patient who usually has um, cool, dry skin to touch, but this is increased pressure. Um, so then they're at risk for breakdown. So making sure we're paying close attention to their skin in our assessment, um, working with our assistive personnel to make sure we're doing our turns and offloading appropriately. You'll see drug therapy utilized to remove excessive fluid. Um, a lot of this being done with diuretics if the patient has normal kidney function or dialysis if not. Monitor closely for response. So again, reassessing, evaluating for appropriate outcomes. We should in, um, see fluid loss, um, increased urine output, we, but we want to monitor for signs and symptoms of dehydration, right? Because again, we, we could do too much and then we're now dealing with dehydration versus fluid overload. Remember how we assess for signs and symptoms of dehydration. Revisit that again, your signs and symptoms from the previous discussion we just had. Also, how do we assess um, for skin changes in our older adults? That's again with assessment um, for tinting over their sternum. Assessing for potassium and sodium fluctuations, monitoring our EKG due to cardiac. Remember, always thinking about cardiac changes when we're thinking there may be um, an imbalance of potassium. Recommending a low, low sodium diet for a patient. Education can't begin soon enough. You don't want to wait to the day of discharge to begin to talk about all the things your patient needs to be considering. It's overwhelming. They're less likely to retain it. So talk with them early. Talk with them daily um, about the low sodium diet. Let them know that where the sodium goes, water goes. So that's increase their risk of fluid overload. When you're thinking about who would um, be someone that'd be great to have in their care team, that would be your um, registered um, dietitian. They can get in there and talk with them about how to maintain adequate nutrition in regards to sodium balance. How do they monitor their weight at home? The importance of that weight gain of two pounds or more in 24 hours, that's a concern. That's when it's red alert. You need to know they need to be notifying their primary care providers, their cardiologists, if that's who's following. Um, early intervention is the best way to prevent um, complications like the pulmonary edema and sometimes even can avoid a hospitalization and can be managed on an outpatient basis with close monitoring. Cannot stress enough the use of that dietitian or nutritionist helping them know um, how to read food labels. And sometimes it's a barrier. It's um, limitation of access to fresh fruits and vegetables, ability to keep them fresh. Um, Y'all probably know it's hard to keep vegetables, um, fresh vegetables long at home. So how can, how can we meet them where they are? Um, what kind of uh, social work community resources are available to them? Now we're going to begin to talk about some electrolyte imbalances. We're going to begin with discussion over hyponatremia. So what's happening here? This means that the inside of our blood cells have more solutes, intracellular fluid than extracellular fluid. Remember with osmosis, your water wants to even that inside and outside um, component of our cells. So water will move through the semipermeable membrane into the cell to help even out this balance. So when this happens, our cells are gonna to begin to swell, become too large potentially and be at risk for rupture. So this means again, that the inside of our blood cells have more um, solutes than the extracellular um, fluid. And this osmosis is gonna to attempt to regulate this, but this is gonna increase our risk of our cells becoming too large and potential for rupture. So what causes hyponatremia or sodium level um, less than 136? Increased sodium excretion, inadequate sodium intake, so excessive elimination, limited intake, or dilution 
of our serum sodium. Well, when can that happen? That can happen with fluid overload. So looking um, in your text, you have a box 13.5 on page 261 that reviews some of the risk factors in PO status. NPO. That's one of the main reasons for our electrolyte imbalances related to hypostatus or those that are um, less than normal range. That's a big factor um, for our patients. So always monitor them closely when they're NPO for procedures or due to disorders um, that are present for them. If they're on GI rest or have um, placement of an NG tube to low intermittent suction. Rapid and fluid infusion of hypotonic solutions is listed there. Um, so a hypotonic solution um, such as D5, dextrose 5% in water, why is this hypotonic? So initially in the bag, so in your IV fluid bag, that D5 in water is actually isotonic. Okay, Isotonic meaning it wouldn't cause shifts between the membrane. But I just told you it's hypotonic. Why? So it's hypotonic because once it is infused into our client, that dextrose is going to be rapidly metabolized. Okay. When that happens and we lose our dextrose in the solution, it is now a hypo hypotonic solution. Okay. So we have to be aware of our patient who's receiving this um, type of fluid is going to um, be at risk for hypotonic um, signs and symptoms and electrolyte shifts for that reason. Now with hyperglycemia, so elevated blood glucose, wh what's happening here? Why is that um, a risk in the hyponatremia? So how are your sodium levels affected? What's happening here is with the presence of hyperglycemia, you're going to have osmotic shift. Remember, that's a water fluid shift from intracellular um, to extracellular, we want to dilute um, that excessive um, glucose that's present. So diluting the extracellular fluid is going to decrease your concentration of sodium, right? Um, so that's gonna increase your risk of hyponatremia. Um, inappropriate um, secretion of your antidiuretic hormone, that means you have too much ADH anti diuretics, so we're not voiding um, too much being secreted, so we're holding on to too much flu fluid, and that's causing dilution of our sodium and other electrolytes. Overuse of diuretics, okay, inappropriate use of diuretics, misunderstanding of diuretic therapy, always a risk for shifting electrolytes, including hyponatremia. And then um, we've talked about same thing with heart failure. They tend to have too much fluid. They are experiencing fluid overload. And so that's causing inappropriate dilution of our sodium. What are we going to see in our patient? Very important. Um, we talked about sodium being a part of excitability for cells, key role in function of our cells, transmission of nerve impulses. Therefore, if we have low levels of sodium, our patient's going to be sluggish, fatigued, and weak. Um, their neurological assessment, they may be confused, may experience coma with prolonged hyponatremia. The reason for this is they're having those enlarged blood cells, okay? So they're experiencing swelling of their cells. It's going to lead to increased intracranial pressure in their brain. With this increased intracranial pressure, it's going to impair the ability of blood flow to adequately perfuse there due to increased pressure and impair circulation. Your patient's at risk for seizures um, with both fluctuations and hyponatremias we're talking about now, but also hy hypernatremias we'll talk about in the next slide. Our brain does not like high or low sodium levels, just as our heart does not like high or low potassium levels. Now let's talk about neuromuscular. You'll have decreased deep tendon reflexes. So if we have decreased um, neuromuscular function, an organ we definitely want to be concerned about um, is our diaphragm, okay? So our diaphragm um, is going to be suppressed. If this organ um, is not able to assist with our breathing um, in a patient who's experiencing hyponatremia and that muscle of the diaphragm is weak, they may be um, increased risk for impairment 
um, of adequate perfusion of oxygen. So we have to, again, prioritizing our ABC. So if our patient experiencing hyponatremia, we want to assess for like shallow, um, inappropriate, slowed um, respirations, okay? And so then that's going to put them at risk for hypoxia, but also a respiratory um, acid base imbalance, as we'll talk about in chapter 15, but something you should already be thinking about from your fundamentals lecture. Cardiovascular assessment, if you have too little sodium because your body may be depleted, such as with hypovolemia, um, with hypovolemia, as we talked about, dehydration means there's little um, volume to circulate. So your patient's likely going to experience a rapid, weak, ready pulse, um, trying to compensate for that lack of adequate blood pressure. Now, if we have too little sodium due to hemodilution, so that's someone that's experiencing circulatory overload, fluid overload, um, your patient may still have a rapid pulse, but because it's not a volume issue, it's not going to be weak and thready. It's going to be bounding. They'll also be experiencing a higher blood pressure, maybe some hypertension with and experience that narrow or low pulse pressure that we talked about earlier. If the edema is severe, so if they have um, severe um, third spacing, in their lower extremities or even upper extremities, you may have difficulty finding the pulse. And that's because of um, the third spacing. It's not because they truly have a weak and thready pulse, it's because it's difficult to assess through the fluid retention. GI assessment, why would our patient be having diarrhea and active bowel sounds with hyponatremia? Well, let's talk about that. So with low sodium, um, if we're talking about this from a standpoint of too much water, so hemodilution of, of um, sodium, too much fluid on board, the osmosis effect, our body again is going to try to compensate by movement of water into our intravascular space, okay? Increased gut motility, hyperactive bowel sounds, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And this is our um, way of our bodies trying to regulate the fluid, trying to assist with its removal then um, increase elimination in stool. So that's why you may see hyperactive bowel sounds, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting with hyponatremia. So how are we going to care for our patient? What's our interventions? How are we going to take action here? Safety, 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 airway, breathing, circulation, um, monitoring um, for fluid overload, hypernatremia. Uh, we'll need um, IV fluids here. Actually, that's osmoles that are going to be on the high end with higher solutes. So usually 3% um, normal saline is a, is a common example. If your patient is receiving 3% um, normal saline, a hypertonic solution, why would they be receiving this? Remember, we talked about the cells are swelling, okay? So a hypertonic solution is going to cause an osmotic shift from that intracellular space to the intravascular space um, to help dilute those excessive solutes that are being infused to our patient. But this has to be usually done in a critical care area, always on an IV pump, because our concern, again, um, is that we're going to have the opposite effect and we're going to begin to shift them into hypernatremia. This is not hypertonic fluids. It's nothing you're going to ever see bolused or, or free hanging again. Only isotonic fluids can be bolused, okay? Rapid changes, shifts in our electrolytes and um, our fluid volume spaces from intracellular to extracellular is going to increase our risk of seizure, coma, and death for our patients. So again, nothing we should ever be rapid infusing, making sure we have critical um, reassessment ability of our patient. Let's say the hypo um, natremia is due to fluid loss, then we're going to usually prepare to administer IV fluids to correct this. But again, if it's due to fluid volume excess, it's due to dilution of our sodium, you may um, be administering osmotic diuretics. And this is to promote excretion of water, but not excretion of sodium. Now we're going to talk about hypernatremia. So this is usually a sodium level greater than 45. This is going to make 
ourselves too excited. Okay, hyperactivity is the opposite of hyponatremia. We have too much sodium, too little fluid inside the cells because osmosis has occurred. This has moved water from inside the cell to the intervascular space to help dilute the sodium. So what are we going to see in our assessment? This is part of our recognizing cues. Everything is excited. So a neurological assessment, our patient may be confused, agitated, restless, anxious. As this persists, um, or if this is due to fluid overload, um, we may have comatose lethargy in our patient. And this is back to that increased intracranial pressure from the swelling, the intracellular swelling of cells and decreased perfusion. Now, neuromuscular assessment, um, our patient usually experiencing twitching due to too much excitement. Um, let's think about this as just you have too much energy and you've been running around for hours. OK, so you're having this twitching response, this overexcitement. But can we keep that up? Can our muscles keep twitching? Can they keep responding? Can they keep having too much energy? Um, the answer is no. They're eventually going to run out of energy sources. So um, same thing happens to our body here. It gets tired. Our cells become um, too excited. But then at some point, they're going to begin to slow down. OK, so we begin to see this overexcitability in the beginning this hyperactivity of deep tendon reflexes, but over time, as this condition worsens, those deep tendon reflexes will diminish, okay? Let's talk about our diaphragm again. So we talked about with hypo that it would be shallow, slow respirations. Um, here, we're gonna have increased overstimulation of the cells in the diaphragm. So that muscle is gonna um, cause increased respiratory rate um, from the fl either fluid um, being on board, but also the overexcitability. Cardiovascular assessment, we'll talk about in lecture. It'll be helpful when I can draw what we call an action potential. This would be a review for A&P, um, a part of our conduction that allows our heart to contract. It's unique to our cardiac cells. In order for our hearts to contract, this action potential has shifts um, and membra membrane um, potential of sodium, potassium, and calcium. So for this contraction of the heart to occur, um, our sodium builds, okay? So it builds up this energy. But again, this energy has to cut off at some point. The reason it needs to cut off is if it doesn't cut off, then your potassium cannot take over and finish the cardiac contraction and allow rest before the next time for a heartbeat. So for potassium to do its thing in the action potential, um, you also need calcium to facilitate that as a gatekeeper. So if we have too much sodium on board, we're not going to reach our cutoff point. We're going to exceed that. It's going to delay the ability of calcium to do its job and potassium to do its job. So we have impaired contractility of the heart with hypernatremia. Um, we need it, but now we have too much of it and inhibits the ability of calcium and potassium to do its job in the contraction of the heart. So if we have decreased contractibility of the heart, so it's not squeezing as it should, it's not acting as an effective pump. So it's not doing its job of delivering that oxygenated, uh, oxygenated blood from the heart. So how's our body gonna compensate? If it's squeezed power, if it's contractibility is decreased, um, we're gonna try to increase our heart rate, okay? Um, so we're going to say, well, if we're not squeezing as much as we should, we're going to increase the number of times we squeeze to try to compensate for that lack of squeeze. So we're going to increase the number of times we contract since we've lost our squeeze capacity. So depending on the cause of the hypernatremia, we may therefore see an elevated or decreased um, blood pressure. So what medications or nursing interventions will you anticipate? To, um, for, to decrease sodium levels so we can use hypertonic fluids. Um, isotonic fluids can help fill the tank. So again, if this hypernatremia is caused by fluid loss, isotonic fluids is not gonna cause an osmotic shift. So we're just gonna fill up our tank. We're likely gonna recommend a low sodium diet. If our patient is um, receiving diuretic therapy like um, furosemide um, to increase kidney excretion, 
We want to monitor for excessive fluid loss, hyponatremia and hypokalemia. So we're shifting our patient in the other direction of electrolyte um, imbalances. Safety precautions here, um, fall precautions, skin precautions, frequent turning assistance, monitoring urine output, educating our patient. Again, that cannot begin too early um, in your care for your patient about a low sodium diet. Moving on to potassium imbalance. Remember we said earlier in the lecture, potassium on you think cardiac, cardiac, cardiac. So hypokalemia, who's at risk? Um, your book has a table there of those um, that are at risk. We want to know that our geriatric population um, is at risk based on use of diuretic um, therapy. They also have a urinating um, concentration ability that's decreased. And in general, that their body um, fluid components are less than that of a younger adult. Also at risk, so emesis, um, excessive vomiting, excessive diarrhea, suctioning with an NG tube, okay? It's gonna directly remove our electrolytes, specific our potassium. So always assessing for that with our patients we're caring for who have the um, low intermittent suction via NG tube in place. What, are, what else are we gonna see? Um, with the ABCs still making that a priority here, if we have low excitement with hypokalemia, we're going to see a decrease in neuromuscular function. So again, we have to focus in on that diagram. We may see shallow breathing with our patient. So prioritizing rate, rhythm, and depth um, of respiration with hypokalemia. May also see generalized weakness, decreased deep tendon reflexes. Cardiac, 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 we anticipate cardiac changes. The possibility of um, dysrhythmias with high or low. So how are we patient? They need to be on telemetry or a cardiac monitor at all times. Neuro changes with hyperkalemia, they may have low cognition, um, changes in level of consciousness, confusion, anxiety. GI, so we're going to see decreased um, motility here. They're prone to constipation, hypoactive bowel sounds, abdominal distension. Your action alert box there on page 263 is very important. Assessing that respiratory status, as we just talked about, at least every two hours because of respiratory insufficiency and cardiac dysrhythmias are major causes of death from hyperkalemia. Medications and nursing interventions, monitoring our ABCs, placing on the cardiac monitor. We want to try to prevent further potassium loss, implement fall precautions. Um, you want to star the red and yellow boxes on page 263 of, of your text when we're talking about administration of IV potassium replacement. We'll talk about that here in detail as I read those off to you. Um, drug therapy for management, when we're replacing it, usually means these potassium supplements such as potassium chloride. If diuretic therapy is being used, we want to make sure we're using potassium sparing diuretic like spirolactone. If we're seeing shallow respirations or decreased respiratory rate in our patient, just as we talked about earlier, that does increase their risk of an acid and base imbalance um, as they retain. CO2. So if they have a high CO2, they're at risk for respiratory acidosis. Remember what we said about the relationship between magnesium and potassium. So if our potassium is low, it's likely that our mag is low um, as it's the transporter for um, potassium and calcium. So making sure we're assessing those magnesium levels. Our patient who um, is diabetic and has elevated glucose um, specific, we'll talk about in lecture and um, later on in 1940, diabetic ketoacidosis. If they're receiving um, insulin therapy, if they're on an insulin drip, this can cause potassium um, to be shifted back into the cell. And we'll talk about the reasons for that um, when we approach that in 1940. But what you need to know, if they're on an insulin drip and they're having a shift of potassium from extracellular or intracellular, then they may be, begin to experience some um, hypokalemia. So their monitoring would be the same just as we discussed. 
and they may be receiving some potassium riders or potassium replacement um, therapies as well. So looking at the um, drug interactions here, I'm sorry, the drug alert box is on page 264. Your potassium must be diluted, okay, for intravenous administration and must be administered slowly. Um, this rate is recommended at 5 to 10 milliequivalents per hour in accordance with the National Patient Safety Goal. Not to be given by IV push ever, ever, ever. Um, do, it, do not administer um, potassium undiluted or IV pushes. This can cause cardiac arrest. Just we said that acute shift or potassium doesn't like higher low levels. So it has to be replenished slowly and accurately, not by IV push. So looking now um, at that action alert below it, if infiltration of a solution occurring potass containing potassium occurs, we have to stop that IV solution immediately, um, remove that venous access, notify the primary care provider, and of course document all these actions we took that we took place. It may include um, photography to monitor um, recovery. Now, potassium, the reason for this, it's a severe tissue irrigant. Um, that's why it's never given by IM or sub-Q injection. Unfortunately, with infiltration of potassium, that patient can experience um, tissue necrosis at that IV site. Um, you can imagine this occurring in um, an upper extremity that's full of nerves um, and muscle tissue. Your patient could experience loss of function, re could require um, surgery intervention for degreement, could require um, mus muscle and tissue grafts here, involvement of um, a plastic surgeon. So if your patient is receiving IV therapy, we have to reassess, reassess, reassess constantly um, as they're receiving the therapy, advise them if they experience any discomfort at the IV site, they need to notify um, nursing staff immediately. To assess that IV site, your book says hourly, um, I'd say at least hourly, um, and ask the patient again about any burning or pain in that IV site. Now we're going to talk about hyperkalemia or serum potassium level typically greater than five. This is going to cause too much excitement um, when transmission of nerve impulses within cells. So who's at risk? Definitely our geriatric and renal patients, as we talked about. Um, our renal system, our kidneys, are eliminate 80% of our potassium. So if there's impairment within our kidney function, then we're going to be at risk for hyperkalemia. Um, table 13.7 on page 264 reviews um, the common causes there of hyperkalemia. It states there rapid infusion of potassium ca containing IV fluids. Um, this is talking about um, those that have it supplemented in to IV fluids, but remember with our um, like potassium chloride supplements, supplementals, we're not going to go over 20 mil equivalents per hour. This is referring to like lactator ringers and blood products. So both of these contain a small amount of potassium. Blood products um, tends to be the older that they are, the, the more risk of the hyperkalemia there from rupture of red blood cells and release of the intracellular potassium. So again, not referring to your potassium supplements or your potassium riders, but more of your um, like LR that may have it in it or your blood products. Now, salt substitutes, these are of use for a lot of your clients who are on low so sodium diets, so your heart failure clients. They're at risk for hyperkalemia from salt substitutes, so important for them to be aware of this. They think they're making a healthy choice by utilizing salt substitutes, but they're actually increasing the risk of hyperkalemia. So can somebody tell me um, or be thinking about how ACE inhibitors or ARBs can increase potassium? We'll talk about this extensively in lecture. Um, the RAS system, we're decreasing that sodium, therefore, um, we're also decreasing the um, excretion of potassium and allowing for retention of potassium leading to hyperkalemia. So be able to think through that as you prepare um, for lecture. What are we going to see in our assessment? This is our recognizing cues portion. So we're going to see um, muscle twitching, leg weakness, unusual tingling, numbness in the hands, feet, or face. Um, 
usually that's followed it extends it got kind of goes from your from your hands feet and then it kind of circles in around the face as hyperkalemia worsens um, muscle weakness is also common as it begins to rise And talk about nursing safety priority this is a critical rescue box on page 265 of your text assess anyone at risk for hyperkalemia to recognize cardiac changes patient's heart rate falls below 60 beat per minute t wave becomes spiked i will demonstrate this during lecture both of which accompany hyperkalemia and then notifying our rapid response team the reason for this is it's going to significantly increase their risk of deadly arrhythmia such as ventricular fibrillation. Your patient may report palpitations, skipped heartbeats, um, may experience some hypotension with this, so increased risk for safety concerns and fall prevention strategies for our patient. Respiratory muscles are, um, are not commonly affected unless there's, again, these lethal levels of hyperkalemia. Your patient may experience um, diarrhea, and also as they experience this, um, muscle weakness with persistence of hyperkalemia this tends to occur from the hands and feet first and then advance to arms and legs so that's also going to put your patient at risk um, for safety and falls now what um, medications or nursing interventions are you going to anticipate we have to focus still on our abcs never ever forget the prioritization of your abcs um, want to have them on a cardiac monitor probably getting a 12 lead ekg so we can see um, aspect of the heart implementing fall precautions and then prioritizing um, decreasing potassium levels well i'll draw out um, a mnemonic on the board for you in lecture it's called c big k drop with the c standing for calcium glutinate the b and big standing for bicarb the I in big standing for insulin and the G in big standing for glucose and the K standing for KX elate and the D in drop standing for diuretic therapy or dialysis. Um, the D there with diuretics or dialysis, we want to increase potassium excretion with diuretic therapy like furosemide um, to help reduce that potassium level that's greater than five. This is if our kidney function is normal. If not, or if not responding, then we're gonna reach for um, typically dialysis for our patient. Now insulin, we've talked a little bit already. So insulin is gonna increase the activity of potassium movement from um, extracellular fluid into the cell. So um, your patient may be receiving insulin therapy not because they have um, elevated glucose or um, hyperglycemia, but because they have hyperkalemia. We want to move that potassium from um, the intravascular space to inside the cell. Um, but if we're using um, this for this reason, 
your patient should be receiving an IV fluid containing glucose because if not, they may experience um, hypoglycemia. So it's important that those occur together. The KX alate is going to bind with um, the excessive potassium in your gut and allow it to be eliminated in, in stool and also decrease the absorption of um, the potassium as well from dietary intake. Now your calcium glutinate, it's not going to affect potassium levels, but we know that we have to prioritize cardiac with hyperkalemia. That calcium glutinate, remember it's the workhorse, it's going to help restore the cardiac cycle. It's going to help, we talked about the action potential, so with that too much potassium, it's going to help restore cardiac function, help normalize the effects of potassium um, that it has on that action potential and the cardiac function, okay? Now your sodium bicarb, um, also um, not going to directly affect potassium levels, but it's going to help normalize the um, acidity that we can experience with elevated potassium levels um, when it causes metabolic acidosis. So again, remember sodium bicarb is a base. So if we're adding that base into an acid environment, it's going to help neutralize, bring us back to homeostasis. We'll review this again in chapter 14, but should all be ready be a review from your fundamentals lecture. Very important if your patient is receiving IV fluids with potassium or oral potassium supplements. Um, you come on shift, you see that these are infusing or you have orders to give them to your patient. You want to make sure we're assessing potassium levels before administration. What were those 4 a.m. draws? Are they now um, experiencing hyperkalemia from our interventions? Were those um, outcomes not assessed closely or reassessed appropriately? We need to notify our ordering provider. These supplementations need to be stopped. I've seen this many a times when orders did not expire appropriately or there was not that assessment and follow through. The next few slides are going to review the clinical judgment model and how we utilize this in identification, um, care, and evaluating outcomes for our patient experiencing electrolyte imbalance. You can proceed um, with this yourself and answering the questions there that are on each slide, but we also will be reviewing this in the lecture. Moving on to calcium imbalance, we're first going to talk about hypocalcemia. This is usually a calcium level less than nine. Remember that calcium job, it's the workhorse. You want to think neuroexcitability. Its effect is on the bones, beats, and blood, um, with blood meaning clotting factors. So hyper, I want you to think of a mom. So I relate it to my son a lot. So as a mom, I may be too overbearing too controlling. So if um, my son was a calcium mineral, my presence um, regarding neurons would mean that they he's depressed and slow. So if he's um, a neuron and um, regulation of that, I'm always present, I'm hovering, I'm a helicopter mom, and therefore his actions are depressed and slow. Whereas on the opposite end of that, if I'm hyper, um, that means that I'm not as present, and then my son acting as a neuron may be out of control and wild, okay? So that helps me remember it kind of has the opposite effect of what we've talked about so far with sodium and potassium. So who's at risk? You want to star your common causes box there. If you have a low calcium it usually allows other electrolytes also to get more excited. So again, opposite of what we've discussed so far with low, so far meaning slow and sluggish, and now low is meaning excited. That mom is not there to oversee the neurons, so they are out of control and wild. So again, thinking of calcium, we're going to think of bones, beats, and blood, action on bone, muscles, and nerves. 
our body cannot produce calcium, right? So we lose calcium through the skin, through nails, hair, feces, and urine. It's important to get enough calcium from the food we eat. And now we're going to talk about what we see in our assessment. So again, num numbness and tingling, fingers and toes, some possible twitching, cramping, spasming, if hypocalcemia is present. You'll see demonstration of two signs um, in figure 13.11 and 13.12 on page 266 of your text. Trousseau sign there is demonstrated with a blood pressure cuff. So if you were to put a blood pressure cuff on your patient's upper extremity, inflate it greater than their systolic blood pressure, you'd watch to see if you observe spasms in the hand due to this neuro excitability. This would be indications also that your patient's at risk for seizures. The one below that is um, Chavostek sign if um, it's facial muscle contractions, if you were to tap there um, just forward um, to the ear. This also is an um, indication of risk for seizures if caught early. Your patient's going to have this hyperactive deep tendon reflexes. The calcium levels here, um, this hyperkalemia is usually caused from loss of its presence in bone storage sites. So therefore we may lose our bone density. So if our bones are becoming less dense, they're more brittle and frail, they're increased risk for fracture and break easily with even the slightest motion and trauma. So that's important when handling our client, when educating our client as well. So what medications and nursing interventions are you gonna anticipate? Yeah, still prioritizing your ABCs, monitoring for seizures as we've already talked about, placing our patient on seizure precautions, which typically means um, that they have um, oxygen and suction there at the bedside. Um, in the past, this has mean like um, padding rails um, with their hospital bed. That's no longer um, an indication or a lot of hospital policy. So you want to follow what your facility has in place for seizure precautions. We'll review this and implement these and monitor for their presence in the clinical setting during our clinical rotations. You want to replace their calcium with supplementation. It's an IV or PO form. Um, the goal of administering their meds, these meds is to increase calcium absorption, but remember we have to have vitamin D to aid in absorption of calcium from the intestinal tract. Um, aluminum hydroxide um, does reduce um, phosphorus levels and your calcium and phosphorus also have an inverse relationship just as we talked earlier about sodium and potassium. So that may be utilized to reduce phosphorus levels, causing the counter effect of increasing um, your calcium levels for your client. You are a reduced stimulus. So if your patient is at risk for seizures, you don't wanna overstimulate them. You wanna keep their room quiet, limiting visitors, reminding visitors um, to not cause too much stimulation, adjusting the light, using soft voices. Now, talking about the brittle, frail, frail bones and increased risk for fracture, we want to make sure we're using a lift sheet with our patient and including education for them on food sources that are high in calcium. Going back to your calcium and phosphate um, regulation. So, um, calcium and phosphate is regulated by three hormones, your parathyroid gland, your calcitrol, and your calcitonin. So, we've talked earlier about that parathyroid hormone is for release from your parathyroid gland. This is released in response to a decrease in potassium, uh, sorry, calcium levels like in hypercalcemia. This activates osteoclasts. Remember your osteoclasts cells, they actually break down the matrix of bones and then they release calcium. Um, and that's where we get the risk of the frail, the frail bones increased risk for fracture. Your parathyroid hormone also increases gastroabsorption of calcium by converting vitamin D into its active form to absorb calcium. So we're getting it released from bones. We're also increasing absorption in our gastric tract. Your calcitonin is released from the thyroid gland in response to elevated blood levels. So um, this is in hypercalcemia. So it's going to increase your osteoblasts with the BN blast. Always reminds me of building. So it's building action is going to remove calcium from blood 
and increases absorption in the bone matrix. Hypercalcemia, so this is usually a calcium serum calcium level greater than 10.5. Um, it's gonna affect heart, muscle, and nerves, intestinal smooth muscle. You want to again, make sure you're aware of those common causes of um, hypercalcemia listed in your text. Now we're gonna talk about what we will see in our assessment. Um, cardiac changes, remember it's the, it's the cardiac work course here. It's the most serious and life-threatening complication of hypercalcemia, so how should we monitor our patient? We should place them on a cardiac monitor. We wanna assess for slowed or impaired perfusion as they're likely gonna experience muscle weakness and decreased deep tendon reflexes. The reason, again, I try to remember this with is you have that helicopter mom over the neurons, um, and so now their sons are slowed and depressed opposite um, the presentation when we saw the hypercalcemia that we just discussed. Patient may be confused and lethargic, decreased GI motility, therefore experiencing constipation, abdominal distension. Now, how are we going to care for our patient? What nursing interventions and medications will we anticipate? Um, cardiac monitoring, we're going to avoid calcium replacing items. We may give um, isotonic IV fluids like um, normal saline as it will help um, excrete that excessive calcium through urination maybe administering biphosphates to help um, absorb that calcium back into bone because remember um, phosphorus has that inverse relationship with calcium so if calcium is high um, phosphorus will be low so then giving a phosphorus replacement like a biphosphate is going to address both both electrolytes your calcitonin as i just talked about um, you're going to see that calcitonin um, be released to inhibit calcium reabsorption. Um, and so you will no longer have movement out of the bone and actually have reabsorption there um, into the bone. Hypomagnesium. So this is usually a serum mag level less than 1.3. Magnesium's goal is to relax muscle and nerves. Um, so if we have too much, that equals too relaxed. And then here with being too little, we'll see the opposite. Um, so who's at risk? Let's talk, there's the table there in your book that talks about the lack of intake or, or use of loop or thiazide diuretic. Um, and you're gonna have increased membrane excitability. The reason this is occurring is because you're likely going to have hypokalemia and hypocalcemia. Electrolyte imbalances, because remember magnesium is the transporter for these. Excited um, membranes may depolarize spontaneously, so they're at increased risk for hypertension, dysrhythmias. Um, that heart muscle does not like when our mag or potassium levels um, are low or high, having those fluctuations. Hyperactivity, deep tendon reflexes, numbness, tingling, muscle cramps. They may experience positive Chebex and Trousseau sign. Again, this is because hypomagnesium and hypocalcemia tend to occur together. They may have tetany and seizures as hypermagnesium worsens. What Nursing interventions, how we care, what we anticipate in the um, care plan for our patient. Typically, administration of magnesium sulfate IV. Um, this also is utilized for um, seizure, respiratory depression, preeclampsia, as you'll talk about in OB um, with Ms. Roberts, as it is a smooth muscle relaxant. Elevated magnesium, this is usually a serum magnesium level above 2.1. Also reflects back to that table that talks about common causes of elevated magnesium. Magnesium, we just talked about it being a membrane stabilizer, muscle relaxant. So most symptoms of hypermagnesium are a result um, of reduced membrane excitability. 
So in our assessment with our respiratory muscles, they're going to appear weak, respiratory insufficiency. This can lead to respiratory failure. Um, cardiac assessment typically is going to demonstrate bradycardia, hypotension, vasodilation. Again, all relaxing factors here. Increased risk for cardiac arrest because our patient's not going to experience ad adequate perfusion to cardiac muscle. Your CNS or a neuro assessment, decreased neuro impulse. So your patient may be drowsy and lethargic, um, decreased or absent deep tendon reflexes. Next, how are we going to care for our patient? What do we anticipate? Still prioritizing the APCs. We want to place our patient on a cardiac monitor. Um, do not want to administer IV fluids um, that contain magnesium. Um, loop diuretics can um, reduce magnesium levels. If this is a renal patient, therefore they have um, decreased ability of um, the renal system to re remove the excessive magnesium. They may need dialysis. Um, patient may receive IV calcium chloride or calcium glutinate. This is to reverse the effects of the magnesium on um, the calcium muscle. So just as we talked about this in the C big K drop, um, the use of the calcium glutamate used there is used same here with high levels of magnesium present.